Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington, where President Biden will soon deliver his State of the Union address. The stakes are high for the president, who will be speaking to millions of Americans for the first time since Donald Trump became the presumptive Republican presidential nominee. And as Democrats are increasingly anxious about the president's political standing, and as Republicans are signaling they're going to make Biden's age and fitness a pillar of their campaign against him. For those reasons, this is no ordinary address for the president. His remarks will be viewed not just as a state of the union, but as the start of his argument for re-election. So what can we expect tonight? Well, White House sources tell us the president wants to primarily talk about kitchen table issues, like saving people money, while also laying out his second term agenda and striking a strong tone on reproductive rights. Here's what White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said just yesterday. The president will outline an agenda that is about continuing to build on the progress that we've made over the last three years. The president has always been an optimistic person, as you all know, and even in the face of challenges that we have in front of us, he will share why he is hopeful about this country's future and why it is a mistake. It is a mistake to bet against the American people. Now, administration officials also telling us today the president will announce an emergency mission to establish a port on the Gaza coast to get more humanitarian aid to Palestinian civilians in increasingly desperate need. We will have more details on that in just a moment. But for President Biden tonight, his performance is going to be just as important, if not more important than the policies he lays out. Our NBC News poll last month had 76 percent of all respondents saying they're concerned about the president's mental and physical health for a second term. That includes a majority of Democrats and 82 percent of independent voters. And ahead of today's speech, Trump campaign allies unveiled a blistering attack ad questioning if the president will live for a full second term. The Biden campaign called the ad, quote, a sick and deranged stunt from a broke and struggling campaign. Meanwhile, Democrats are hoping for a repeat of last year's address, where the president was sharp, forceful, and quick to respond to Republican heckling. Take a look. Some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. <laughs> Other Republicans say, I'm not saying it's a majority of you. I don't even think it's even a significant. <laughs> but it's being proposed by individuals. I'm not politely not naming them, but it's being proposed by some of you. So, folks, as we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be sponsored. All right. We got unanimity. One of the more memorable moments from last year, of course. Well, the president is facing the very real possibility of disruptions again tonight from Republicans on the issue of the border and from progressive Democrats on the situation in Gaza. The big picture, folks, this could be the single biggest night in presidential politics for a while. It could also be the president's biggest audience before the election. As President Biden likes to tell his doubters, watch me. Well, millions of Americans will be doing just that tonight. Joining me now on this very big day is NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. NBC News senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is in Amman, Jordan. And with me on set is NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans. Kelly, I have to start with you and this big news coming out of the White House today. The president planning to make this announcement about Gaza to increase aid there. What can you tell? Tell us about this. I know you've been working your sources throughout the day. What are they telling you? Well, Kristen, this will be an opportunity for the president to address one of the hot issues that has been a conflict he's been dealing with and one that has brought out a lot of passions and emotions in our country and around the world. He will lean in heavily to humanitarian aid creating with U.S. military a gate, if you will, that would allow greater U.S. humanitarian supplies to flow into Gaza. Part of what I expect we will be hearing from the president tonight is a very raw acknowledgement of the pain of what has happened in the Israel-Gaza war on all sides, and at the same time, the extreme loss of life and hardship for the Palestinians living in Gaza and the concerns there. What more can the U.S. do? The U.S., of course, still wants a temporary ceasefire, wants hostages to be released, and wants to work on 
flowing in humanitarian aid while Israel has a right to defend itself. But this will be a way for the president to answer some of the critics within his own party, some of the voices around the world. It's a significant opportunity for him to announce a new plan to demonstrate American leadership and at the same time really let the American people see uh, how he feels about this issue and acknowledging it. We have seen many times uh, on the campaign trail where there have been protests, whether they were in the room with the president or they were outside at events and so forth. If that happens tonight, advisors I've talked to say the president is adept at handling those moments, wants people to be heard. There are, of course, not only lawmakers in the chamber, but each lawmaker has a guest. So those guests sit in a gallery out of camera view, typically. And there could be those sorts of interruptions. The White House is prepared for that. They expect that if it happens, the president will use his spontaneity, his ability to be uh, quick-minded in those moments, they argue, much like the clip you played at the top, which was about a different subject, but that reacting in the moment, which they believe not only on substance is important, but is also a way for the American people to see the president in the way that advisors see him, they say, uh, in a longer format, not just quick clips that might be on the Internet, a long speech that will give him a chance to address big policy issues. Kristen? Kelly, we should remind our viewers, you have often been in that chamber when the president is delivering a State of the Union address. Take us inside tonight's challenges. Here you have a president who's running for re-election. He's in a deeper political hole than some of his predecessors heading into tonight's speech. And the performance, as you were just talking about, is going to be as important as all of these policy issues, right? One of the things advisors believe is that most Americans are not tuned into the president in the way that you and I are. It's our job to follow all of his speeches. For most Americans, they're seeing short clips. They're not paying attention with the same level of interest. And seeing him in a longer format, uh, which in many ways might go against sort of the shortened attention span that we're also accustomed to now. They want that moment to allow him uh, to tell the story of the things that they believe he's accomplished, the things that he still believes are yet to be done, and to draw the contrast between himself and his predecessor. I don't expect that the president's going to call out Donald Trump by name, but he will talk about the policies. And when you think about the issue of age, which the White House readily acknowledges is one that is on the minds of American voters who are considering this, expect to hear the kinds of things we've been hearing the president say in a recent appearance he did on uh, late night TV with Seth Meyers, where he talked about old ideas versus new ideas, that he argues his ideas are about the future and that his rival on the Republican side, his predecessor, is about old ideas, meaning things like abortion rights being taken away and concerns about voting rights access and democracy. So it is a chance to have kind of a stagecraft theatrical moment, a sort of wellness check on the president in addition to a lot of substantive issues that he wants to talk about and an argument that he will make about the contrast between his vision and that of uh, Donald Trump. All right. Well, Kelly, you laid out all of the stakes for us. With that, let's go over to Sahil, who is on Capitol Hill, where the main event is going to take place. Sahil, set the stage. We know that the House Speaker has invited a, a number of guests, as is customary. Who are the guests who stand out to you tonight? What do they tell us about his agenda? Yeah, that's right, Kristen. Speaker Johnson has invited a pretty expansive list of guests uh, for him to the State of the Union that point to the issues that he would like to highlight as uh, President Biden speaks at that lectern. These guests include parents of hostages in Israel, trying to draw attention to that issue, a freed hostage in Israel as well, trying to convey his support and his party's unequivocal support for Israel. They include a Jewish student at MIT uh, aiming to draw attention to the issue of rising anti-Semitism, particularly on college campuses. It includes two police officers attacked by undocumented immigrants, trying to draw attention to this nexus that Republicans have been pointing to uh, of migrants committing crimes. Also, a mom of a child killed by an MS-13 gang uh, same theme here. You kind of get the picture. And a university president who opposes transgender athletes, another issue that is popular among uh, conservative lawmakers and conservative culture warriors in particular. 
notably, Speaker Johnson is bringing the parents of Wall Street Journal's uh, imprisoned journalist Evan Gershkovich, who's been imprisoned in Russia. This is a, you know something that's raised eyebrows from Johnson's critics, who argue that he's blocking aid to Ukraine, blocking the the biggest thing he could be doing to try to confront and take on Russia. I suspect we'll be hearing a little bit more out of that uh, in terms of what Johnson intends to do going forward. Johnson has said. Quote, while America's State of the Union is sadly in decline, these individuals remind us of Americans' greatness, even in the face of such challenging circumstances, unquote. Kristen Johnson is hoping that this is going to be the one and only time he's sitting with President Biden at that dais. It is going to be a really stunning moment to see him there, his unlikely path to his current post. Let's talk about this message that he's sending to his conference to be respectful. This is something that this speaker takes very carefully, the decorum of the House. And again, at the open of the show, we showed that clip of President Biden getting jeered last year at the State of the Union. Do you have any sense of how people responded to him? Are we expecting to see rowdiness tonight on the floor? Yeah, Kirsten, at the risk of quoting your own great reporting back to you, Johnson <laughs> wants his members to essentially behave. He doesn't want to see a repeat of what we saw yesterday, this yelling and the interrupting and the heckling of President Biden. Of course, it didn't really work out well for Republicans. President Biden got the clips he wanted. He was able to handle that pretty well on his feet uh, in the eyes of his allies and in the White House. They'd be happy uh, for that to happen again. But to your specific question, it's not clear that Johnson's members are going to listen to him. The people who were involved in this kind of behavior last year, uh, members like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, are not the types who uh, are particularly inclined to listen to leadership. They fancy themselves as rebels and iconoclasts, and they tend to go their own way. What they do uh, remains to be seen. I wouldn't be surprised if even they don't know what they do, if this is kind of a spur-of-the-moment thing, that they react to something he says uh, and decide to start shouting. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. And, of course, we will be watching for every shout, every facial experience expression and response tonight because that's what makes it so interesting. Sahil, thank you so much for that great reporting. Really appreciate it. We want to turn now to NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel, who is in Amman, Jordan. Richard. We saw firsthand today how the aid operations into Gaza are working, these airdrops. We were on a Jordanian military plane that left from Jordan. It flew through Israel over Gaza and dropped uh, pallets uh, of food over the northern Gaza Strip, which is seeing the worst humanitarian crisis uh, in, in all of Gaza. People are, are starving to death there now, uh, particularly children and, and vulnerable people. And um, from what we were able to see, it is helpful, it is helping, uh, but it is not nearly enough. It is far too slow. Very limited amounts of aid can get in. It is very expensive, and it's extre it is extraordinarily time-consuming. The one plane that we were on today, uh, the, the route had to be cleared with the Israelis. It involved a large Jordanian uh, air crew, a very professional air crew. It took their time. They had to coordinate the route with the Israelis to make sure that uh, there was no mid-air incident, that they weren't shot down. And uh, the, the kinds of items that they're allowed by the Israelis to send in uh, is limited. The planes have to be inspected. Uh, it, it is not uh, the kind of, uh, of, of solution that will provide the, the level of relief that Gaza needs right now. Now, President Biden is expected to announce later tonight a new step that the U.S. military will be leading the effort to open a temporary port. The Israelis uh, welcoming that decision, uh, describing it as a dock uh, that would allow uh, far more uh, aid to be uh, to, to go into Gaza by ship, those ships leaving from Cyprus. But that is something that is going to take weeks to establish and could take months to get up and running uh, effectively, leaving uh, the people of Gaza with a fundamental question. Is there going to be a ceasefire soon? Or are they going to have to continue to uh, live as they're living right now in an incredibly precarious situation with a few aid drops or potentially uh, in the coming weeks with a temporary seaport? That will be a significant announcement tonight indeed. Richard Ankel, thank you so much for your great reporting. I want to turn now to Christine Romans, who joins us here in D.C. I am so thrilled you're here. I'm glad to be here. Christine, thank you for joining the show. Let's start off just big picture. Sure. Let's talk about the economy. When President Biden took office, 
several years ago. That was obviously one of the big headwinds he was facing. Right. It's still politically speaking a headwind, but the picture looks a lot different. Now. Well, when you think of that old, you know, characterization, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Exactly four years ago was the beginning of COVID. So COVID distorts every kind yeah. of number that we talk about. But what you'll hear from the president tonight, I think, are two kind of frame ways he's going to frame the economy. One, people feel nickel and dimed and he knows it. And mm. big companies uh, maybe are not passing along some of their own cost savings. They have prices too high and he's trying to root out places where they can lower costs for Americans. And everything from housing, you know, to concert tickets, to bank fees, lots of different things. Uh, then you'll also hear about tax fairness. And he'll mm. talk about tax fairness and talk about his budget next week and talk about um, starting to cut deficits, right? And um, tackle some of our, America's fiscal problems by raising taxes on corporations and rich people. And, and let's just delve into the tax portion sure. of this a little bit, because it's getting a lot of buzz. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense of what specifically he's going to announce? He's going to announce some new taxes on large corporations. Right. He wants to raise that uh, corporate minimum tax, right? He wants to raise that. Remember, in 2017, Bush or <laughs> tax cuts from Trump, they were huge tax cuts, bigger even mm. than, than companies have been asking for. He would raise that a little bit. He would say that he would not raise taxes on anybody making $400,000 a year or less, but on billionaires, there'll be a tax. On millionaires, there'll be a, a tax deduction that companies can take off of those salaries that he get rid of that tax deduction. And for companies that buy back their own stock, he would quadruple the tax on the those, uh, those stock buybacks. So a lot of different ways he says that he would make it more fair, the tax code more fair. Again, I think you'll hear a lot about fairness and how he's the guy on the side of families and the other side is on the side of corporations and big interests. His biggest challenge, Christine, it seems to me, is this disconnect between the numbers and how people feel about the numbers. The fact that inflation has come down significantly just since last year, is there a sense that over time people will start to feel it? What needs to happen in order for prices at the grocery store to go down? So certainly the hope among economists and White House economists is mm -hmm. that over time people will start to feel it because wages have been rising more than inflation. But that disconnect is jarring. And those inflation scars, Kristen, are deep and they are fresh. Mm -hmm. And when you look at grocery prices, this is a number I really like to quote. From January 2020 to today, grocery prices are 25% higher. So your grocery bill is a quarter more today than it was mm. at the beginning of this crisis. And that's something people feel every week or so. So you can talk about a stock market at record highs. You can talk about a record big size of the American economy, record small business creation. Over and over again, all of these superlatives about the American economy, but it comes down to those fresh inflation wounds and how long it takes people to start feeling a little better about things. And just finally, Christine, student loans has been a big yeah. issue for people all across this country. The president's canceled millions of dollars in student loan debts, and yet there's more he says he's planning to do. Yeah, and there's a new program that he started. It's called the SAVE program, where for people who qualify and sign up for this, um, you, you don't pay... You, you don't pay more than you can afford for how much money you make. And you don't have the interest growing more and more and more and more, even as you're paying the bill down. And that in, in July, people will start to feel some real, real relief on there. And he's going to mm. talk about that again tonight. You remember, it was, a, it was a campaign promise to cut all that student loan debt. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do it. He's going to talk about how he's found other ways to use the powers and the levers that he has to try to get some relief to people with these student loans. All right. Well, I know that the economic piece of this, the economic message, is just going to be a really significant part of his speech yep. that people will be paying close attention to. So thank you nice for helping you. us understand it. Great to see you, Christine. Really appreciate it. And special coverage of State of the Union. The State of the Union begins right here on NBC News Now at 8 p.m. Eastern. We will be on the air until midnight with all of the highlights and analysis. And coming up, we have breaking news out of Nashville, where federal law enforcement officials have just announced charges against an Army sergeant for allegedly leaking military secrets to the Chinese. But first, throughout the hour, we'll be taking a look back at states of the Union delivered by presidents as they were seeking re-election, starting with former President Ronald Reagan in 1984. The tide of the future is a freedom tide, and our struggle for democracy cannot and will not be denied. This, this, this nation champions peace that enshrines liberty, democratic rights, and dignity for every individual. America's new strength, confidence, and purpose are carrying hope and opportunity far from our shores.
And welcome back. We're following breaking news out of Nashville, where federal prosecutors have just unsealed an indictment against an Army sergeant who they say transmitted sensitive military information to a co-conspirator in China. NBC News investigative correspondent Tom Winters joins me now with more. So, Tom, what do we know? What's the latest here? Well, Kristen, the FBI arrested Corbin Schultz, who's apparently a sergeant and a U.S. Army intelligence analyst this morning at, uh, at Fort Campbell in Tennessee. Uh, the arrest is part of an ongoing investigation since June of 2022. And according to the indictment, Schultz has been stealing U.S. military secrets and providing it to a co-conspirator based in Hong Kong for approximately $42,000 in cash over that time period. The list of what he stole is fairly incredible, including a, uh, and I'm just reading from the information we're getting as it's coming in, literally as I speak to you, Air Force tactics and techniques and procedures for the F-22 fighter aircraft. That's one of the most sophisticated military aircrafts anywhere on the planet. Um, talking about techniques and procedures for certain helicopters, as well as the U.S.'s capabilities and understandings of what would happen if China attacked Taiwan. You, the U.S.'s understanding of what that might look like from the Chinese side and what type of response could be there. Obviously, that could be potentially helpful to this co-conspirator based in China if he's sharing that information or, in fact, is a member of the Chinese government. For the Chinese government to understand what the U.S. thinks it will do would be obviously incredibly important. There are some other uh, details and information in here as well, but uh, he did possess a uh, obviously a clearance to access this information and appears to have been doing it all for cash. They don't explicitly say that he passed this along uh, to the Chinese government, but we're still waiting for the 25-page indictment to be unsealed. So we only have a limited amount of uh, information from the press release at this point. He's expected to appear uh, later, either today or tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, in a court in central Tennessee, so that's uh, the Nashville region. Uh, this press conference called just several hours ago, uh, presumably following this arrest. He was arrested on an indictment, uh, meaning that this investigation has been going on for some time and, as I mentioned, uh, was arrested at Fort Campbell. So uh, more uh, digging and information for us to gather. But, Kristen, I think taking a step back here and looking at this in totality, We've had a week of potentially really troubling information involving the U.S. military in its secrets. You remember earlier this week we had the sentencing for Jack Teixeira, uh, excuse me, the uh, guilty plea of Jack Teixeira. He was arrested approximately a year ago with sharing top secret, uh, some very serious secret information uh, online on the online platform Discord, uh, which authorities were able to track him down to that. We had another member of the U.S. military charged for sharing information over a dating app with somebody based in Ukraine including what the U.S. was doing or knew about with respect to Ukraine uh, military capabilities and, and our understanding of what's going on in the conflict there. And now you have more information, this time uh, going to another uh, potential U.S. adversary in China. Uh, and this uh, information appears to have been quite sensitive and also uh, has to do with uh, export control items. So in other words, uh, actual U.S. military technology and capability. So uh, obviously a serious investigation led by the FBI's counterintelligence division and by the U.S. Army's Intel counterintelligence division. And will something we're going to continue to track uh, here through the afternoon. All right. Well, Tom, I know this is just breaking and you gave us a really robust download, so we appreciate the great reporting. Thank you for joining us. Coming up next, I'll talk to a Democratic senator who's at the center of action for her party on Capitol Hill and on the campaign trail. Minnesota senator and vice chair of Senate Democrats' campaign arm, Tina Smith, joins us next. But first, a look back at President Bill Clinton's State of the Union address in 1996 as he set a course for re-election. The era of big government is over. But, but we cannot go back to the time when our citizens were left to fend for themselves. Instead, we must go forward as one America, one nation, working together to meet the challenges we face together. Welcome back. As we mentioned, the president's State of the Union address will carry extra significance tonight as he lays out his vision for a second term with a rematch against former President Trump now essentially set. Of course, the fate of any second term Biden agenda will hinge on which party controls Congress. And Democrats are fighting an uphill battle this cycle to hold on to the Senate. 
33 Senate seats are on the board this November. Democrats are defending 23 of them with a number of races in red-leaning states and key presidential battlegrounds. Joining me now to discuss this is Democratic Senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. She's also vice chair of the campaign arm for Senate Democrats. Thank you so much for joining me, Senator. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Krista. I'm so glad to be with you. Well, we are so glad to have you. We're so glad to have your perspective. President Biden, of course, getting ready to deliver his State of the Union address. He is facing, as you know, some headwinds as it relates to the war in the Middle East, as it relates to his age. What do you want to hear from him tonight? What does he need to do to have it be a successful night? Well, I think the president is going into this evening really ready to make his case to the American people about the progress that we've made, the work that we have left to do, and the great contrast between his approach and the approach of Democrats and the uh, approach of Republicans. I'm expecting him to be very specific about what he has done, what we've done to lower costs for prescription drugs and to um, expand um, access to health care, but then also to talk about his vision for what more we need to do to um, continue to lower costs for prescription drugs, to lower housing costs, to get after this um, kind of corporate greed that is driving up prices in some areas and leaving a lot of Americans just wondering what the heck is going on. What do you think he needs to do to quell the concerns about his age? If you look at the polls, more than 70 percent of Americans say they do have real concerns about his age and his ability to serve a second term. Well, you know, um, tonight he is really in his element. He is so comfortable um, in this building. He is um, accustomed to the traditions and the uh, the kind of uh, way that people behave in this building. And I'll just remind you that last year when he was um, kind of, um, you know, got some feedback from the audience <laughs> as he was giving his speech, he really engaged with that. And I think it showed him in, you know, showed him for the person that he really is, ready to engage, ready to dive into it and, and ready to make his case. So I feel like he's going to be in a very good place as he as he goes into the speech tonight. I think that's part of it. But it's also, I think, Americans wanting to hear, like, what does he want to do and where do we go from here as we um, look towards the coming year? We had reported that the president is going to talk about the border, but he's not going to unveil any new executive actions, though we know the administration is considering executive actions as it relates to asylum. Do you think that's a mistake to not roll out something new? on the border issue tonight to use this massive platform to address that issue? Yeah, I mean, here's what I think about that. You know, we have a bipartisan agreement that was struck between Democrats and um, Republicans in the Senate with a lot of feedback and great support from the White House. And then what happened? Um, Donald Trump and the Republicans said, no, we don't want to actually make progress on the border and on border security. We'd rather keep this as a political issue. And so I think the president has laid out what it is that he believes that needs to happen at the border. Um, let's just take the issue of, um, of stopping the flood of fentanyl at our southern border and the need to have the technology and the um, border security in place to stop that. We have a plan for that. And the Republicans have said no. So I think he will make that case tonight as well he should. And let's talk now about your home state of Minnesota. We saw that uncommitted vote, which we also saw in Michigan, 19 percent in Minnesota in the Democratic primary. It was a protest vote effectively to for voters to protest President Biden's handling of the Israel-Gaza war, or Israel-Hamas war, I should say, the war in Gaza. How concerned are you about that being an electoral problem for President Biden come November? Well, so what I think happened in Minnesota is that, first of all, Minnesota has a long and strong tradition of activism and grassroots organizing. And I think what we saw on Tuesday was uh, people who are just so deeply concerned about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, and they wanted to make their voices heard in that election. And that's what happened. And, and what I have been saying to people and what I really truly believe is that the president shared their concerns. He is working hard to reach a place where we can have a stop to the violence, we can have a, a, a long ceasefire, we can return the hostages, and then we can move to where we need to get to, which is a way for both 
Israel and Palestinians in the reason, region to have their own states and where everybody can live in peace and dignity. That is what he is working for. I think in many ways the president shares the concerns of those. But you're asking really an electoral question, which I respect. And my strong view of it is knowing many of the people who voted uncommitted on Tuesday is that that is not a reflection of how they intend to vote in November. Mm -hmm. They understand what that choice is. And um, they know clearly that if you care about Palestinians, in the Middle East that um, that Donald Trump is, is a disaster. Let me ask you about Senator Menendez, if I could, one of your colleagues. He now facing yet another indictment, this time being charged with obstruction of justice. You had previously resisted calls for him to resign. Does this latest indictment change your perspective at all, Senator? Do you think it's time for him to step down? Well, look, you know, I'm deeply concerned about the allegations around Senator Menendez. I think that it is extremely troubling. To tell you the truth, what I am focused on as I think about my role in the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is making sure that we uh, that we win, uh, make sure that Democrats win in New Jersey and that Democrats win around the country so that we can keep and even expand on our majority. And that's where my that's where my focus is. Well, let me ask you this just to follow up. Do you believe the DSCC should provide financial support to Senator Menendez if he does decide to run for re-election? And of course, he hasn't announced that yet. Yeah, of course he has. And let's just be clear. He hasn't announced what he's going to do. We have two candidates who are running in New Jersey who have announced um, and who are working really, really hard. And I'm going to let that process play out. And the Democrats uh, and the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is going to make sure that we win. I would also say that New Jersey has elected a Democrat to, at the federal level for many, many years. And I think that what we're, what we're going to be doing is putting our resources into the states um, where we need to. I would point you to what happened on um, this weekend in uh, Texas, where we um, have a very strong candidate ready to uh, ready to challenge Ted Cruz, one of the most unpopular Republicans um, in the country, who won in a nine-person field, Colin Allred, um, with almost 60 percent of the vote. So there are lots of places where we're going to be looking to um, build our support and, I believe, um, protect and even expand our majority. Senator, just to be very clear, I don't hear a yes or a no. Are you willing to to go so far as to give a specific answer on that, or you're going to wait till he... I mean, I mean, it, it, there's too many hypotheticals involved in that, and who's going to be the candidate, and we're just going to wait and see how that all plans out. But I, as I said, I don't expect that you're going to see the DSTC putting resources um, into New Jersey, which is a strong Democratic state where our Democratic candidates typically win. Let me just get your reaction to Senator Cinema, who became, of course, the latest senator to announce she's not going to seek re-election. I want to read you what Senator Dave the chair of the NRSC said. He said, with recent polling showing Kirsten Cinema pulling far more Republican voters than Democratic voters, her decision to retire improves Carrie Lake's opportunity to flip this seat. What do you make of that? What's your response? Well, that's a noble effort on the part of Senator Daines to put um, a, a pretty face on what is a very challenging situation for Republicans in Arizona. With Senator Sinema uh, announcing that she's not planning on running, we have a very strong candidate in um, Arizona, in Ruben Gallegos. And even the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee's own polling shows that Ruben does better um, in a two-person race um, beating uh, uh, Carrie Lake, who is kind of the Republicans' worst nightmare. Not only does she deny that uh, Joe Biden won the presidential election, but she denies that she lost the gubernatorial election, mm. so she's running for Senate at the same time she's denying that she lost the governor's race. All right. Senator Tina Smith, we sure did cover a lot of ground today. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Coming up, the tough tasks ahead tonight for President Biden in both style and substance, plus the fallout from the new attack ad from a pro-Trump super PAC that the Biden campaign is calling a, quote, deranged stunt. The panel will be here to discuss that. And as we take a break, a look back at President George W. Bush's State of the Union address as he sought re-election. For all Americans, the last three years have brought tests we did not ask for and achievements shared by all. By our actions, we have shown what kind of nation we are. In grief, we have found the grace to go on. In challenge, we rediscovered the courage and daring of a free people. In victory, we have shown the noble aims and good heart of America. 
And having come this far, we sense that we live in a time set apart. The state couldn't be higher. The interest of the nation and his own presidency is at stake in this single address. No State of the Union address in my 13 years in the United States Senate has mattered more than this one. What's at stake is not just the issues he discusses, but the way he comes across. He needs to be someone that is authentic and real and belies all of the chatter about his age. Well, that sets us up nicely. That was Connecticut's senior Senator Richard Blumenthal talking about what is at stake in tonight's State of the Union address for President Biden. For more, I'm joined now by my great panel, NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli, Stephanie Shriok, senior advisor to the Strategic Victory Fund and former president of Emily's List, and Jim Garrity, online columnist for the National Review. Thanks to all of you for being here. Really appreciate it. Mike, I have to start with you. You have been at the White House working to your sources, set the scene. How are they viewing tonight and what are you watching for? Well, this is such a critical opportunity for President Biden to address what has been really the elephant in the room, the issue of his age. We've been reporting on this for weeks now that I don't think I've ever spent this much time talking not about the substance, the policies that are going to be in the speech, but how it's going to be received, how the president is going to perform. The president has so often said when asked about his age, watch me. This is going to be the biggest audience he has until the Democratic convention later this summer to really show the country that he's up to, for the job. And they know that. They've been looking forward to this. What is also interesting, though, is because last year they were talking so much about how successful he was at parrying with the Republicans yeah. in the audience. They pointed to that to show that he is still sharp. He's still on, on, on top of his game. You almost wonder if they're now overcorrecting or setting expectations too high that they're almost going to try to manufacture a moment. It worked because it was spontaneous. Right. And so if, if they're trying to set that up for tonight, it might not be as effective. That's a fantastic point. And we know, Stephanie, there will likely be a few hecklers in the crowd I would tonight. imagine so. I would imagine um, so. To, to Mike's point, though, how important, and you kind of heard uh, Senator Blumenthal talk about this, that authenticity factor. If there is a manufactured back and forth, it won't feel the same as it felt last year. What do you think he needs to do? Well, I really hope that there isn't something being manufactured. I completely agree. It's got it's always got to be authentic. This is his moment where he gets to be Joe Biden in a chamber he is used to being in. I mean, he he is a a creature of of Congress. So he's got lots of friends in there and I think he <coughs> just me. has to. It's Sorry. Okay. We, we were just talking about that. Allergy season. It is. It is everywhere. Uh, but I do think that, you know, he is going to need to perform. It is definitely the point of, of conversation. And I think he's in a good place to do that. But boy, the eyes are on him. Yeah, they sure are. Jim, uh, we know that Speaker Johnson has advised his conference to have decorum. He has urged them not to interrupt and interject. What are you going to be watching for tonight? And do you think that that could work against Republicans if there are too many? Well, interviews? Marjorie Taylor Greene has already said decorum is dead, uh, which I think is almost just throwing <laughs> up the red flag before the bowl. Get, get ready. I, I don't even want to speculate what Boebert's going to do. You just kind of know that there's going to be fireworks from the usual folks who are, you know, basically looking like they're auditioning to be reality show folks. I, I, let me actually step back and say, I actually don't think is, this is as huge a night as Blumenthal and some other folks are making it sound. It's a speech. Joe Biden has given a million of these. As long as he doesn't trip on the way down the aisle, doesn't lose his place in the teleprompter and look around confused or something like that, mm. it, of all the things the president's got to do, delivering the State of the Union is actually not one of the tougher ones. Just, yeah. you know, stick to your script, shake everybody's hand, take selfies, and by the end of the night, things should be okay. It's interesting because this is an inflection point, as the term Biden likes to use so yeah. often, <laughs> in the way that the Biden team thinks about the campaign, right? Usually th this is an opportunity to set the agenda, to talk about the policies you want to lay out. But the Biden team has talked about how we think of Mario Cuomo. You govern in uh, prose, you campaign in poetry. The, the mood of the country is now more receptive to hearing the argument of one candidate for, an, for another. That's really at the heart of how the campaign views this speech tonight. And so they think he, he will talk about the same policies he's talked about the last three years, but voters will be actually more engaged into, you know what, let me think about this versus Donald Trump. The timing, of course, so yeah. pivotal. 
coming just two days after Super Tuesday. I was I just thinking that, like, this this coming right after yes. Super Tuesday, the general election yeah. is upon us. This yes. is it. It is happening. So tonight, what I believe we're going to really hear is the beginning of the clear contrast. This election is a choice, and I think President Biden is going to lay out that choice very clearly, not just in what he has done, and he has yeah. done so much for the economy and for the country, but also what is at stake moving forward and what he needs to continue doing for the working families of this country. Jim, we know that former President Trump has said he's going to counter-program this event. He's going to be on Truth Social throughout the night. And a, a MAGA Inc., mm -hmm. a, a super PAC, is out with a blistering new ad, effectively raising the question, will President Biden survive for a full second term? Could that type of tone potentially backfire? Well, I think that's in keeping with the Trump style. He's not a man for subtlety. He's not a man for hinting or winking or, or something like that. Um, and, and this is one of the side effects of people being concerned about Biden's age. One is he's still going to be mentally all there. Is he still going to be able to physically? Every time he trips and falls, we all kind of, you know, clutch our hearts, afraid that this is going to be something serious. So it's in the back of our minds when you come out and say, I think the guy's going to die. Then that is a little <laughs> in people's faces and might people might see people recoil. Yeah, Mike, the campaign is just firing back in full force. Inviting the, the former president, if he wants to, you know, see how the president's going to perform, watch tonight. The thing that I think quietly the Biden team is really looking at in this moment is the role of the media in the campaign, frankly. I think Trump's team has a much better sense of the media mind, perhaps, than the Biden team has shown, uh, frankly speaking. And so it's not an accident how they rolled out this ad. The mm. morning of the State of the Union address on shows like Morning Joe, uh, it was quickly on the New York Times website. Places where we, in the sort of echo chamber of Washington uh, conventional wisdom centers, they knew we were going to see this and then talk about it all day. That's where they want the conversation to be. And the challenge for the Biden team is to put it back where they want it, which is on the issues and on the contrast. Biden could come out and say, not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of another person we're going to be watching closely tonight, the Republican response, Jim, Katie Britt. Mm -hmm. What do you make of her? What does she need to do? Look, this position has an ancient gypsy curse on it. Everybody who gives the response to the State of the Union has a disaster. <laughs> Senator Marco Rubio would say, stay hydrated. That's a very important aspect <laughs> as you're speaking. One of my favorite you know, moments. Honestly, the, the president really. gets to be on the biggest stage imaginable, and everybody in the party will jump up and applaud every time he pauses. You're alone in a room, you're staring it's at a terrible. computer, and you're yeah. saying, the president is wrong about this. And shockingly, it's not as impact, as big, big an impact and exciting as the other one is. Stephanie. And then the vast majority of folks... Yeah. Shut it off. Like, they don't even, they don't even see it. So she, there is that. She is, um, is Stephanie going to be talking about IVF, reproductive rights, something that Democrats want to own. Republicans are trying to take that issue back. Yeah, they're not doing a very good job. <laughs> and it's only going to get worse and worse. And you heard uh, Speaker Johnson just completely... Uh, like make a mess out of IVF, and he is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. They just, like 195 of the House Republicans just voted against a contraception bill. Uh, they're blocking, the Republicans are blocking an IVF protection bill, while the legislature of Alabama actually moved one through and, and the governor signed it. So uh, this is, again, the Republicans are just on the wrong mm. side of a major issue, which is, by the way, reproductive freedom freedom in its entirety, yeah. and they're against the vast majority of the population. So they better figure out how to get on the correct side, and it's not going to be one or two people. Chris, we're going to yeah. hear more from the president tonight yes. about reproductive health than we've probably ever heard him yeah. in this stage before. Last year was just a brief uh, set of comments that's going to be a major part mm -hmm. of his speech tonight, and it really speaks to the larger theme. Uh, I have some new reporting out this afternoon about freedom. He's going to invoke Franklin Roosevelt's State of the Union Address, mm -hmm. 1941, where Roosevelt outlined his four freedoms, and Biden's going to show how you adapt that to the modern age, the freedom to marry Marry who you love, the freedom, reproductive freedom, the freedom to vote. These are all part of the big thematic push from the president uh, that is going to be part of the raising the stakes of the election as well. All right. Well, you all set the stage very well. We'll be watching it closely. <laughs> Thank you for a great conversation. Mike Memoli, Stephanie Shriok, and Jim Garrity. Really appreciate it. Coming up next, White House Communications Director Ben LeBolt joins us as President Biden prepares for tonight. But first, a look back at President Barack Obama's 2012 State of the Union Address as he sought re-election. The state of our union is getting strong. We've come too far to turn back now. 
As long as I'm president, I will work with anyone in this chamber to build on this momentum. But I intend to fight obstruction with action, and I will oppose any effort to return to the very same policies that brought on this economic crisis in the first place. Welcome back. We're just about four hours away from President Biden's State of the Union address tonight. For more on what to expect, I'm joined now by White House Communications Director Ben LeBolt. Ben, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here, Kristen. Thank you. So set the scene for us, Ben. What can we expect tonight? Mike Memoli talked about the fact that he is going to lay out his argument that with another four years, he will protect the freedoms of this country. What should we be watching for? Well, I think there are three key components to the speech. That's one of them, defending individual liberties in this country that have been under assault from MAGA Republicans. You know, Donald Trump appointed to the Supreme Court the justices that overturned Roe versus Wade. And after that, you've seen not only choice, but IVF, contraception, a whole host of things under assault. In addition to Republican legislatures passing similar legislation in states, the president is going to stand up uh, for women's rights, stand up for families' rights, and fight to restore Roe versus Wade. He's going to stand up for and call on Americans to join him protecting our democracy. This is a real high-stakes moment where democracy is under threat at home and abroad. You saw that on January 6th with the insurrection. Donald Trump defended those insurrectionists as patriots. Um, the president certainly doesn't think that they're patriots. He thinks that our democracy is on the line and he'll call on Americans to join him. And finally, he wants to keep uh, the strongest economic recovery in the world going. Uh, 15 million jobs created under this president, the most in history. Inflation is down two thirds since last summer. Wages are rising. The racial wealth gap is closing. Um, and he's got some concrete proposals tonight to continue to lower costs for hardworking Americans. Ben, he's obviously now has a presumptive Republican nominee who he's running against, as you've been saying, former President Trump. Is he going to directly mention Trump's name tonight? Well, I don't think there will be any mystery about who the president is referring to tonight, but a State of the Union has a few goals. The first is to level set where we've come over these past few years, how we overcame the pandemic and the supply chain crisis as a result of the policies that the president put in place that has caused a manufacturing revival against the, across the country and, and 15 million jobs. So that'll be one piece of the speech. Yeah. Um, the second will be the president's forward-looking vision uh, if he has the chance to serve again. We've announced pieces of that today. He'll be taking on uh, the cost of mortgages and providing relief there, for example, health care costs, Insulin's capped at $35 for seniors, prescription drugs $2,000 for seniors. He wants to expand that to all Americans. So his second term agenda will be a part of the speech tonight, but he'll also talk about what he's fighting against, and that's the assault on individual liberties, assault on reproductive rights, assault on our democracy, and you know, just more tax cuts for uh, billionaires and corporations that, that MAGA Republicans have been promoting. So Ben, I hear you saying we shouldn't expect to hear Trump's name but President Biden's going to spend a good portion of his evening drawing that contrast. I think the, the contrast against the MAGA Republican agenda will certainly be uh, part of the speech tonight. Let me get your take on what we heard from Senator Blumenthal. We just played it. He, he talked about the high stakes of tonight. He said that, quote, what's at stake is not just the issues he discusses, but the way he comes across. Do you agree with that, given that polls do show, like it or not, polls show the vast majority of Americans do have concerns about President Biden's age and fitness to serve? Well, look, on age, you heard the president address this uh, last week on Seth Meyers. He and Donald Trump are about the same age. The difference is the age of their ideas. You know, the former president's ideas are from 50 years ago. He believes that Roe versus Wade should be overturned. He did that. He doesn't believe that climate change is real. Uh, he's, he's committing this assault on individual liberties across the country. President Biden wants to lead us into the future. He made the largest investment in uh, climate ever. Uh, he wants to restore Roe versus Wade. Um, I think every day here at the White House, we see the president give extensive speeches and remarks and take tough questions from uh, reporters. Uh, the average person in their daily life doesn't necessarily see that. They're focused on other things. It's harder to break through in this fractured media landscape. But the president will likely have the largest television audience he'll see all year tonight. And so 
I think Americans across the country um, will hear his vision in a way that uh, they haven't recently. One of the big issues looming over tonight, obviously the war in the Middle East. It's our understanding that the president is going to announce a new military mission to get more aid into Gaza. Can you tell us about that? Will that be a part of his speech, Ben? Absolutely. He will touch on that uh, tonight, uh, Kristen. Uh, he'll revisit uh, the events of October 7th and the terrorist attack that was committed uh, against Israel. He'll talk about his work with the Israelis, with partners in the region, to make sure that humanitarian assistance is getting into Gaza uh, for Palestinians that aren't part of uh, Hamas and who are innocent civilians. That hasn't been happening at the pace the president would like to see. Last week, uh, he started airdrops uh, into the country working with the Jordanians. And tonight, he will announce a new maritime humanitarian corridor um, with where ships, which can carry much more than trucks, can get uh, the level of resources that are needed into Gaza. All right. Ben LeBolt, thank you so much for joining us on this State of the Union night. We really appreciate, we appreciate all of your information and perspective. And a programming reminder, State of the Union coverage on NBC News Now begins at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be on the air until midnight with all of the highlights and all of the analysis. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.